Well, hello, friends and fellow pioneers. If you're watching this live, we just had a wonderful time together with Farmer Greg, <laughs> formerly of uh, Phoenix, uh, 54 and a half years in Phoenix, doing the urban farm, uh, amazing initiatives of all the things that, that the community was benefiting from. And now there are some big changes happening in his life. And so we decided to do a part two to talk about how Farmer Greg has is implementing in his own life all the things that he's teaching. And he picked up and he's starting over in a new state, new city, and we're gonna hear all about that. Um, I will say, if you did not catch uh, the previous recording, please make sure that you prioritize to, to watch part one. But thank you again, Farmer Greg, for joining us. And uh, we've had such a, a great time talking about becoming more resilient in the areas of food, of water, uh, seeds. And now let's talk about what brought on this big change in your life. How did this come about? I want to hear about why now, why the location that you chose, mm -hmm. and I would love to hear more about what you are planning. Hi, okay. So um, 54 and a half years in Phoenix, Arizona. This uh, picture you're seeing behind me is the front yard of the urban farm in Phoenix. So that's where we uh, moved from. And we moved to a little over four acres just outside of Asheville, North Carolina. And it was a long time in planning. Uh, apparently, and I didn't remember this, apparently a couple of my friends told me that I had told them about 12 to 15 years ago that when my mom passed away that I was out of Phoenix. And so that, that came as a surprise to me. But when I met my partner, Heidi, uh, back in 2013, uh, I kept telling her I wanted to go someplace quiet. You know, because Phoenix, if you stood on the roof of this house in Phoenix, Arizona, and you could see 75 miles in every direction, there was city. We were literally smack in the middle of 4.8 million, 4.8 million people. And I was really looking for something to uh, quiet that down. And so when I told her nine years ago, hey, I want to go someplace quiet, she said, "You, we can't because all my yoga students are in Phoenix, Arizona, and I'm a yoga teacher, so we're not leaving. And, and I was, okay, well, I'm with you. I'm not going anywhere. And then COVID happened. And before COVID, Urban Farm was offering live events in Phoenix and a lot of in, uh, online events through Zoom and such. And COVID made it imperative that we offer everything online, including Heidi's yoga classes. So Heidi figured out, it took her about 10 days, but she figured out how to get all of her yoga classes online. We set up a, she set up a studio for her, uh, broadcast studio in Phoenix, and we were off to the races. So a year later, she came to me and she said, Greg, where do you want to go? And I was thinking Cottonwood, Arizona, which is a two, uh, an hour and a half drive up into the mountains near, uh, near Phoenix. And, um, and we looked at that and we were up there in, uh, in August and it was supposed to be 20 degrees cooler than Phoenix. And in August we were up there and it was 109 on that particular day. And it's like, no, we're trying to get away from the heat too. So quiet and get away from the heat. And so we started looking uh, pretty much in the Southwest and determined we were still trying to get away from the heat and looked in the, west and realized that uh, you know it's not raining as much in the west and you know there's probably a water problem and so she came to me about four months into this conversation and she said greg Asheville," and i said what are you crazy that's all the way across the country and so we planned a trip we wrote we created a vision board we planned a trip and came to Asheville last August for a week and stayed with some friends of mine here. It turns out I have a bunch of friends here that I've known in the past and online. And we, in August, you know, people were saying, Phoenix were saying, oh my gosh, it's going to be so muggy. 
and it wasn't. And, you know, we, we, Heidi and I, Heidi was in Phoenix for over 50 years. I was in Phoenix for over 54 years. And, you know, we're used to heat. And when the monsoons come in, we're used to heat and humidity. So we get here and, you know, in Phoenix in August, it can easily be 108 degrees with 40 or 50 percent humidity out. And here it is July and people are kind of moaning that it's, you know, 85 degrees and 70 percent humidity on a rainy day. But it just doesn't even phase us. So I think a big reason that we I wanted someplace quiet place that gets more rain. We have actually have started tracking our rainfall here at the new place that we're at. On a website, y'all should check out this website. It's called rainlog.org. And check it out. You, you basically set up an account and you buy yourself a rain gauge. And when it rains, you, you track the rain. And since we've gotten here, we've gotten six inches of rain. And we've been here since Earth Day. So we've been here, what's that, uh, April 22nd till now is about 70 days. And we've had six inches of rain. That was the amount of rain that we got in Phoenix all year. So I'm looking forward to seeing what, you know, once the rest of the year has for us. But uh, there you go. There's there's my story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> I love that. And that's amazing that you already have in 70 days the whole year's worth um so i want to hear about uh you, you mentioned your vision board that you started mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. and um how have i would love to hear a little bit about that and then how have things changed now that you're there mm -hmm. um and mm -hmm. how can you know if you can just tell us like how can people um also connect that with what they can find you know, on your website, like how, how does that vision will relate to uh, the things that you guys have actually made available to people? I would love to hear about how that's connected. Okay, cool. What was the first two questions? <laughs> so your vision board before you move. Oh, yes. Okay. And your current vision board uh -huh. and how that was influenced by your, what you offer. All right, cool. So our vision board really hasn't changed that much. We were looking for a place that we could grow food. And, um, you know, we have four acres now. And I have told people for decades, probably since I learned permaculture in 1991, spend at least a year on a property before you make any major changes. And so going into this move, for me, I was making sure that I kept that front of mind. And as I was traveling here, I was thinking about all the things that I was going to do when I got here. And first of all, leaving a place that you lived for 54 years was uh, traumatic. Uh, and I've had to do a lot of deep breathing to, you know, to get from there to here. And there was a time a couple of weeks ago when it was like, oh my gosh, what did I just do? And I had to breathe through that uh, because it's beautiful here. And the food system. So in my Jumpstart Your Urban Farm, I distinguish something called the local food economy model. And there are seven parts to a local food economy. And a food economy is all of the things that happen inside of the food creation process in order to make it possible. In the local food economy model, there's policy, there's farmers, there's education, there's seeds, there's um, value-added products. There's a couple more that I'm not remembering off the top of my head. Farmer, there's farmers. And without all of those pieces, it's going to be really hard to create local food. And one of the things that I found in two trips, I was here in December uh, and in August of last year of 2021, just to kind of explore the place and check out the new house that we were going to buy. 
And what I discovered was an absolute thriving local food system. There's a nonprofit here in Asheville called ASAP, and they have, I'm going to guess, a couple hundred local farm businesses. Uh, the farmers markets are thriving. Uh, I've never seen them this many and this big. And, uh, you know, just the systems that they have in place to get local food to from the farm to people's plates is absolutely amazing. So that that was a big piece. And all of those pieces, quiet, more rain, um, land to grow on. I'm probably going to turn my front yard into an orchard at some point sooner than later. And uh, all of those things were on the vision board. And what the vision of moving forward looks like, I don't really know. Because I am going to spend a year here just figuring out what I want to do. I'm 61 years old. I have been self-employed since I was 15 years old. And for those of you that aren't self-employed, usually what self-employed means is that you work 24 seven. And so I have spent the last 30 plus years working 24 seven and actually 45 years running, working 24 seven. So I, I need a break. And, um, one of the things I plan to discover is how to grow more food. My my One of my big goals about moving here to Asheville was how can I either source or grow all of my own food? And um, I've recently made friends with uh, Daniel at Olivet, uh, Olivet CSA, which is literally a half mile that way. Wow. And I volunteered to help him come and plant in August. So I'll be helping him plant plants and seeds in August and get his garden growing. So there you have it. That's beautiful. Now I do want, I'm very curious. Is there anything that you've discovered so far that you thought you wanted to do as soon as your first year was over and you decided, um, has anything uh, become apparent yet that you're like uh, feeling pretty certain that I'm um, going to do what's that pretty certain I'm going to do it. That you're, um, that maybe that you're not going to do it. Like you had a vision for something and then you're like, ah, no, I'm not doing that here or I'm not doing that first. So one of the things that's really important to me is fitting in and making sure that I don't step on anybody's feet. I've seen people come, when I was in Phoenix, I'd seen people come into Phoenix and offer things that other people were already offering. And it, it set up a, you know, kind of a not happy situation. And so one of the big pieces for me was that I was going to explore at least for a year to see who was doing what so that I don't step on anybody's toes. Because one of the things that works really well in Phoenix is what Scott Brown does. He has a organic animal food co-op. And the way it works is he uh, takes orders on uh, on odd months, so January, March, uh, and so on. You place your order for your chicken feed or cow feed or whatever you want to, and then on the even months it comes in. It's a, it's a really simple thing that he does, and it's like, oh man, that might be fun to do. And so I was kind of carrying the torch with me across the country that. That's one of the first things I'm going to check out. Well, guess what? There's already three other organizations here in a town of 100,000 people that are doing something like that or something similar. So that's my eyes right now because I'm an entrepreneur. I've had over 30 businesses in my life. Uh, some of them lasted a sneeze. I've had two businesses that have were well over 20 years, my fruit tree program. The Urban Farm Fruit Tree Program is 23 years old, which we still run in Phoenix with a great team that I have there. Um, and I'm so I'm really making sure that whatever I do, I want to uh, be cognizant of not stepping on each other's uh, on anybody's feet. And I want to explore something new. So, uh, you know, I'm I'm just in explore mode and. You know, I may explore for the next six months or six years. I don't know. 
But I did, interestingly enough, I did uh, on Saturday run across an opportunity to teach a permaculture class at a local community college. Wonderful. And it came out of a conversation with somebody. So, I, you know, I'm just where I'm at is uh, a place of uh, excitement. Uh, these have always been, remember I said I've had over 30 businesses in my life. There were times when I didn't have any businesses and it was, wow, what am I going to do next? And that's the exciting piece for me is, oh my gosh, what am I going to grow next? Because there's so many opportunities. Well, that's wonderful. I think listening is so respectful as you are a newcomer. Mm -hmm. And um, also, like you said, understanding that you're in a time of transition and, and listening to what's going on with you also, you know, because um, if you put on too much too soon, then you don't, you're not paying attention and respecting honoring your capacity, right? Yeah. And then that creates like all this chaos later and all these um, things. And that's one thing that sets our academy apart from all, um, all of the things that I see happening uh, with homesteading, I've been watching and listening for years, mm -hmm. is, um, is the internal resilience. You know, like yep. I, we, I believe that resilience begins inside. And yeah. to prepare ahead, you prepare inside first. And we are really, really heavy on that. So I know like uh, no matter how other people are doing rainwater, harvesting seed or food, we're not really competing because our emphasis is pioneering is to be prepared mm -hmm. um, equipped you know encouraged empowered to pioneer and to sustain all the challenges that, that brings and like you said it, it it is very emotionally trying to move and to start new things and um and i appreciate you being transferring and sharing that oh, so yeah. i wanted to um we shared a, a preview with our uh, oh, sneak yes. peek with our previous audience on the video of part one. So yeah. um, here we're going to show a couple of photos of your new place. Mm -hmm. So tell us what um, what we're looking at. So this is our backyard here at our new place. And uh, you can see it goes up the hill. And uh, what I envision, uh, I don't know if you can see my arrow, but what I envision is some terrace gardens. We're not sure yet, but terrace gardens as they go up the hill uh, and back over behind this metal pergola here we're probably going to put a greenhouse um, you know I came from a place that never knew what snow was and apparently it snows here and that'll be cool for about one minute but I want to be able to have a place that we can go outside and have it still be you know at least a little warm so we're going to be doing some uh, uh, structural work to build us a green, some kind of greenhouse there. What I so this is our well, that rock right there in the middle of the picture, that's our well. And I turned this area underneath this tree, part of it, into my Insta garden. Come on, there it is. That's my Insta garden. Uh, and that I did the first weekend we were here. There's one picture. There's another picture. Uh, the tomatoes, interestingly enough, uh, come up, came up with some kind of wilt, like Fusidium yeah. wilt. I, I can't even pronounce it, but, uh, so I'm learning, um, that it's different here. And what I do know is that yeah. this space, uh, where the tomatoes are planted in the ground, I do know that the soil isn't all that happy. And so I have a lot of work to do on the soil. And um, quite honestly, most of those tomatoes in the ground died. So remember last segment I said, don't get discouraged if you kill things. It happens. You got to work your way happen. through it and it's going to happen. Exactly. And then here is our front yard. This is the view out our front door. Uh, and this is the slope going down to a road that's uh, just beyond, just in front of those far set of trees. And I've already met with, uh, so one of the things that I did, the first things I did was I found a permaculture designer here in Asheville. And I've hired a permaculture designer to 
help us envision what we want to do with the space. Uh, because, and you, you might be thinking, well, Greg, you've studied permaculture for the, over 30 years. Mm -hmm. I have in drylands. If you plot me down in the middle of Phoenix and ask me what a tree or a plant is, I can tell you just about every time. I can't tell you any of the plants or trees here. And, you know, I just, it's so different. So I know permaculture structures and how they work, but I don't know how they work here and I don't know the plants and stuff. So it'll be, uh, um, it'll be, uh, it'll be an exciting adventure, adventure to learn that. And I may just decide to putter around in my garden in the back and not do anything. Who knows? <laughs> well, thank you so much for sharing uh, some yeah. highlights of what this new chapter is. And it's a very vulnerable time, I know, um, to, to be in, in such a position because uh, comfort and convenience are not part of uh, pioneering. Uh, right. Especially for the, the first, I mean, probably decade, you know, we have so many things that we're still very uncomfortable with because we're still um, in this laboratory of, I, I ca actually call our place our research and development farm facility because everything oh, is just nice. trying to figure out, you know, what is going to work well for not just this environment, but our expectations and what our mission is and our vision for what the outcome should be. Yeah. And I love that you, the, the humility and the wisdom to hire someone to help you walk through that path. Oh, yeah. To get you on the fast track of like, this is how we do it here. This is the things that um, are have worked well, you know, and um, also when you hire someone, you know, you hire experts or more experienced people, they also can, in a way, help you be on a fast track for building community. And so, you know, the connection exactly. like that, um, you're just going to get so much harvest from your humility and your wisdom to just listen, to receive. Um, and also you're sowing into the local economy, hiring, you know, experts and learning from what they're doing. I'm so excited right. for you that you got to teach a class already locally. That's so wonderful. Right. Um, and, you know, if. From here, it just will continue. Um, the, the seed has been planted. And um, I, I want to, um, you, you mentioned something very personal about how this has affected you and, and the choice that you've made. And I really mm -hmm. appreciate that. Is there anything else that you would say has been um, the most challenging thing in this transition? I know we've covered a lot of, of things. Uh, would, would there uh, be anything else that you would say has been the most challenging thing um, going through this? Hmm. I think one of the big challenging things for me is, um, so we have animals. We brought a dog and a cat with us and they're our family, they're our pets, they're our children. And I woke up a couple of weeks ago and uh, realized that if Heidi and I are out and something happens to us and we can't get home, you know, our kids are kind of stuck and stranded. And so that was an emotional thing for me to have to kind of step through and then start to put in place structures to make sure that that happens or that doesn't happen that we that we're you know that we have a structure in place so that if something happens to Heidi and I mm -hmm. you know our kids are okay so yeah it's it just like I said it's like a vulnerable time right you just go oh yeah. wait <laughs> Wow, yeah. I'm, I'm really susceptible here. And, and then you start building that resilience muscle of how to, you know, survive and become stronger. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. And what would you say to someone that um, is considering a, a move where they transplant to another part of the state, another part of the country, or even another country? Um, you know, what mm. do you, so far, what's the best wisdom or tip that you can share from your experience and, and, and even the, the people that you've walked through going through this before, mm -hmm. uh, for other considering others that are considering this big life change for food freedom, for personal freedom, yeah. what would you say? I think one of the, the big pieces is, uh, and thank you, Heidi, uh, is having a structure set up such that everything's planned. 
we were packing things six months before we left. And so when the movers arrived, we actually had movers move us because we have a lot of stuff to move. Um, we, when the movers arrived, everything was packed. Heidi had, uh, had figured out where we were staying on night one of our trip, on night two of our trip, and night three of our trip, and night four of our trip was our new home. And so we traveled 1,900 miles in four days. And so the big piece for, for me that was like, oh, my gosh, thank you, is that everything was planned. You know, the, yeah, it was all planned and that made it, that made that piece a lot easier. And then that's that, wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. And then, you know, a big part of the reason we came here is for the trees and the plants and the rain and the, uh, you know, and, you know, get out in nature wherever you're at. You know, if you're listening to this one or listening to my podcast, wherever you're at, get out and um you know experience nature and breathe be alive like actually live <laughs> right exactly breathe um and listen you know it's uh so it's such a beautiful thing to learn how to listen up close and, and be mm. mindful of your surroundings and have like you're doing right now take a, a time a season in your day or a season in your life to to pay attention and observe what's going on around you Right. So that you can be more yep. efficient and more effective with whatever you're going to do, because you're not disrupting. Right. If you're if you're listening. Um, so I do want to do, do a shout out to empty pockets, wooden nickel. They said, when I first started my market garden, I generated income with strawberries, then raspberries. How cool is that? That's awesome. I wonder what part of. Um, what if you're watching if you're still on the live stream tell us where you're watching from so um i i will say that one of the really relations that i had that came to me when you were sharing your story of um heidi helping to organize everything is i realized uncertainty is a breeding ground for fear and if you're not finished mm. if you're not prepared then you're uncertain what it's going to look like yep. and it brings so much stress when there's so many unknowns and uh, but you knew that the movers were going to arrive and the things were going to leave and you've got a plan and you're just watching it unfold as opposed to <laughs> things like what's happening right now. Right. Unexpected nature. <laughs> you know, I had um, somebody I had somebody early on in my podcast and they were in Taiwan on a little farm and um, they had roosters in the background. And it's like she, she said, you want me to get rid of them? I said, no, that's perfect. <laughs> Well, I, I have had them sabotage to where I can't. The rooster really is very dominant, so he'll just keep going. So at least this was just a hand. But, but thank you so much, Farmer Greg, that, for this wonderful and really kind of refreshing understanding of what it, it is to move, to transplant yourself. It's, uh, it's a very real thing that a lot of people are experiencing, either the the tension of wanting to do it mm -hmm. and not knowing how that's going to play out, maybe because you don't know how to how, how it's going to play out or where where you're going to go, right? And just having and then having that plan and having the peace of mind that you're doing what you set out to do, but then it's like, oh, like you said, oh wow, I'm in it, <laughs> right? You know, I Hello. did it. Yeah, I'm it's committed. Here. I'm done, right? I'm, yeah. I'm committed to this new place, to this new life and I have to show up now <laughs> and um, and with all of that you know um, we that's what we want people to understand is it's also with understanding with knowledge with listening comes that resilience of experiencing mm -hmm. it through the fast track of watching others do it others do it or doing it well like um, like Greg said um, Heidi helped him to experience a lot less stress because things were structured and planned and it took take such a huge edge off of taking that next step because there's not um, all the, the chaos. Unexpected right. things are gonna come, right? But the yep. more prepared you are, uh, the better experience you're gonna have. And, um, and so we're so grateful for this conversation. If you watch the replay and you have any questions or comments for Farmer Greg, please go ahead and comment on uh, the YouTube. And if you have any uh, questions, you can contact 
Farmer Greg through his website and we'll leave all of the links below. I want to remind you that if you are watching part two first, if you're watching this um, interview first, go back and watch part one where we have some resources for you to find where did farmer greg get all this wisdom from how he's been sharing for decades his wisdom through the urban farm the courses of podcasts and now the community you can join in and support the work that they're doing and follow along their progress as they take on <laughs> their new place thanks again farmer greg any last thoughts before we go yeah um our summit is next week waterharvestingsummit.com talking about one of the more important things right now, water. Great, yes, remember to check the links below and it'll um, send you to all the important places that are very relevant right now, right? Your food, your water, your seed, saving, collecting, harvesting. Um, and please also look up, um, I'm probably gonna create a, a playlist with all of Farmers Greg's, um, all of the interviews that we've done because we went in depth and asked ah, how you can buy you. seeds in bulk through the Great American Seed Up Initiative. That's a beautiful thing to build community and to get some seeds acclimated to your climate and to learn how to harvest your own seeds and save them for later. These are all really important things. If you're not doing these things, please be um, diligent, be intentional about being inspired and empowered by what Farmer Greg is doing right now. Well, y'all be blessed. Thank you so much again, Farmer Greg. May the Lord bless you and keep you, shine his face toward you. Be Gracious unto you, um, turn his countenance towards you and give you shalom peace. Thank you.